important thing that we need to do with children in childcare. We need to keep them healthy and safe, correct? One of the best ways we can do that is by addressing hand washing. And I love what Paulette said at the very beginning. And that's what, to establish a routine of hand washing at the very beginning of the program year. Okay, so the, the children know the expectation of what's, what's supposed to happen when we wash hands because there's all sorts of uh, times that we have to wash hands in childcare. So teaching children at the very beginning is really important to incorporate that into their routine. How old do you think children usually are when they, can, when they have mastered the skill of hand washing to the point where they can wash their hands independently? Does anyone know the age and the, the recommended age? 18, did I hear? Yeah. <laughs> um, but actually, it's seven years old. So Denise was close when she said six. Seven is actually the age when children, you can actually say that the child has mastered the skill. This is the average child masters the skill of hand washing. So until that time, where do we need to be in the classroom when children are washing their hands? In their rooms. We need to be right next to them the whole time. Teaching, modeling, cueing, instructing. Because hand washing is a skill that needs to be learned. It's not something that's intrinsic. It's something that children have to learn and be shown over and over and over again. So it's one of those skills that becomes mastered through repetition and through teachers teaching, you know, the right kind of um, technique for hand washing. Is there a technique for hand washing? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I was preparing for this, I thought to myself, how can I engage this audience? Hand washing isn't the most thrilling subject, but it is the most important. So to connect this to you, I did some research and found that there is definitely a, a connection to child development and hand washing. The Center for Disease Control did a study in the year 2003, and they had one group of children that had intensive health and hand washing promotion. That means what teachers do, showing children how to wash their hands. Another group did not have this hand washing promotion in education. Sure enough, when they tested these children five years later, the group of children that received hand washing promotion were six months ahead in their milestones. And why? The researchers were asking why. Because those are children that did not get as sick as frequently. Children that are sick and have inflammatory processes going on and infections, can they learn? No, they really can't learn because they're sick. So if children are, are sick frequently, they're automatically put behind in their development. So they're, we're making all kinds of connections between appropriate child development and hand washing. So I'd like you to think of that when you're teaching the children, that you're really teaching them to prevent illness, prevent infection, prolong their lives, and also to develop at the appropriate rate and at the appropriate time. Because we don't want our kids behind in any way. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So already you can see just how important hand washing is. <coughs> All right. Um, there is a handout. I think it's in your packet. It's called Hand Washing Basics. Do you all, do you all see that one? It's called Hand Washing Basics. Why do you want to Okay. All right, let me put it up on the screen then so that we can all take a look at it. Here, here. Right here. Okay. Hand washing basics. basics. We talked about the why. Let's talk about the who. Who needs to wash their hands in child care? Everyone the minute they walk in the door. It doesn't matter who you are or what your position is. Children. Children need to wash their hands frequently and we're going to talk about the whens. Teachers, volunteers, staff, kitchen staff, everybody needs to wash their hands. Okay, when. Let's talk about the when because this can actually get a little bit confusing for folks. 
And I want you to look at this list and tell me if I forgot any of the wins. Okay. When you're establishing your routine, like Paulette mentioned, it's best to establish a routine when children walk in and you're doing the daily health check. After you do the daily health check, the next thing they should be doing is washing their hands, correct? Okay. Do all of you pretty much do that in your centers? Many of the centers I've been have that as a basic routine. Is when the child, and a lot of times the parents too, are asked to wash their hands upon entering the classroom. And I think that's a great policy. Does anybody do that here? Can you raise your hands? How does that work out? Would you like to comment? So a lot of times I hear that it takes a lot of time, and I've seen it in certain classrooms. It's such a routine, it doesn't take much time at all after it becomes a routine. Would you agree with that? Well, sometimes it can be so you have to remind them. Okay. Most of the parents have got it now. And they come right in and wash their hands and wash their jobs. Okay, very good. All right, um, before, during, and after preparing food. Before feeding a child. Before and after caring for someone who's sick. Before and after treating a cut or a wound. Before and after administering medicines. Before going home. After using the toilet. After changing diapers or cleaning up a child who's used the toilet. After blowing your nose, coughing, or sneezing. After touching an animal, animal feed or animal food, or animal waste. After touching garbage, after removing gloves, that's a big one, by the way. After cleaning equipment, sinks, toilets, etc. After playing outside, and any time that hands look, feel, or smell unclean. Is any, what is that? Before going into the water paper and then after going into the water paper. Good. That is an excellent point. So everybody write that in on your list. Um, when, when you get your papers, write that one in. It's an awesome example of another time that we're supposed to be washing hands. Anybody else think of any more in child care? Okay. Well, as we're talking about this, you might think of some. Stop me and let's talk about it. Okay. Let's talk about the how. We're going to look at this in a couple different ways. I'm going to show you a demonstration of the, of the really the best technique for washing hands. Then I'm going to show you two short video clips. One of a child washing their hands and another of an adult washing their hands. Okay? And I'm also going to play a washing hands song, which it's, um, it has lyrics that go to the happy birthday medley tune. Okay? So we're going to do those three things. But first I want to show you how you should be washing your hands. And uh, I really was hoping that we could have a room with the sink, but that didn't work out too well. And so I'm going to try my best to just show you how to do that. Okay, first of all, we turn on the water. We should be turning on the cold water first, okay? And then gradually turning on the hot water and checking the temperature of the water. When you wash your hands, water needs to be warm. It should be at 115 degrees and absolutely no more than 120 degrees. And that's per the DCFS regulations. So if you have any questions, if any of your sinks, the water is coming out a little bit too hot or never does get hot, you want to call your janitorial staff and have that checked out. Because water should be warm for children to be comfortable to wash their hands. Okay, so we turn down the faucet and I have the right temperature now. I get my hands wet, okay? Hands are wet. I go and get my soap, three to four squirts of soap, I put it in the palm of my hands like this and rub it, and I make what's called, the kids call, a bubble glove. I do the palms of my hands, do the backs of my hands, backs, between my fingers, like this, fingertips, like this, fingertips, thumbs, thumb, fingers, 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 both hands. Wrist, wrist. Rinse the soap off my hands with my fingers pointing downward so that the water flows down and the germs in the soap flow right into the sink. Should we be rinsing like this? No, we should always be rinsing downward like this. Make sure you get all the soap off 
rinse real well. Get a paper towel from the dispenser. Dry your hands. Turn off the water with the paper towel. Put the used paper towel in a garbage can. It's hands free. So either you have to have a foot pedal or it can't have a cover on it. And that's okay. I want to make it clear, make this clear about the garbage can. If you're just using a garbage can for paper towels in a bathroom, it is okay for it to be in a cupboard. DCFS says that garbage cans have to be covered if there's food or diapers or anything else of that nature in the garbage can. But if it's just for paper towels in the bathroom, it can be uncovered. Okay. Any questions about the technique? All right. Do you all do all of those steps? 15 to 20 seconds. That's for everybody. Even the infants. Well, and do we wash infant hands in the sink? Absolutely, we wash them in the sink. We hold the infant over the warm water and we do this procedure with them and their hands in the sink. You can start the saloon as soon as six weeks. You can start actually when babies are born, they can have their hands washed in nice warm water. So is that the appropriate way or is it either can you use a wife for six months, six week old? What's the standard for that? Is it the yeah, is that's a big question because like how young yeah. is it appropriate to wash your baby's hands as far as what's required? The best the best is always using <coughs> soap and water in the sink. In a pinch, you can't get to the sink. And when we do the diaper changing routine procedure, you're gonna see in that procedure we have there's at one point when you have to use a wipe to wash the baby's hands in the middle of the procedure. And that's acceptable. Any other time, though, everybody should be washing their hands in the sink, including infants with the assistance of the teacher. Does that make sense? Yes. I'd like to hear from the programs. What I demonstrated to you, is that what's happening in your programs? Yes and no. I'm hearing both. Okay. How can we get this procedure down in the programs? Let's troubleshoot this. I really want to hear how we can improve this. How can we get that 15 to 20 seconds in for complete hand washing? Sing it a song. And I'm going to play you a song that's been actually designed for young children to teach them how to wash their hands. This procedure should last 15 to 20 seconds minimum each time you wash your hands and each time a child washes their hands. Have you ever timed your kids when they're washing their hands? I was at a center yesterday and I saw some hand washing and it was this, 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 grab the top. And I said, mm -mm, maybe not. Let's, let's step back. Let's have the teacher show the child how it should be done. So that teacher did. We stopped everything. The teacher modeled for all the children. And boy, did things change after that. So do you see how important this teacher involvement is? A lot of times I go into centers and you know everything's all busy as usual and I hear, I hear, why don't you go to the sink and wash your hands? And the teacher's over here and the child's over here playing in the water and in the sink. Is that really hand washing? Okay, so how can we improve that? What needs to be done? Come on teachers, I want to hear some suggestions. Stand right by the child. Excellent recommendation. Stand right next to the child and either model for them if they're not understanding or cue them to as to the next step. Okay. And even talking them through palms, palms, back, back, between fingers, thumb, thumb, finger, 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 wrist, wrist, rinse. Okay. Otherwise you can sing the song. What some other what are other suggestions from other programs that you've seen work in your programs? Do you need to allow enough time for all the children in the class to actually do this properly? Yes. So you might want to think about your routines and how you can spend a little bit more time washing hands before we eat, after using the washroom, and these types of things. Okay? I just want to
wanted to show you a hand washing video. Germs can live on hard surfaces for several days. Most people get sick when they touch these surfaces and then touch their eyes, nose, or mouth. Wash your hands often to keep yourself and others healthy. To wash hands properly, rub all parts of hands and wrists for at least 15 seconds. Wet hands. Use enough soap, usually two to three squirts. Lather soap and scrub hands well, doing the back of each hand and palms. In between fingers, the fingertips, each thumb, and the wrists. Rinse hands under running water. Dry hands with a paper towel. Then use the paper towel to turn off the tap. Throw it into the garbage. CDC TV presents Health Matters. At the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, we are very interested in preventing transmission of disease in, in our community. People aren't washing their hands as often as they say they are or as often as they should. Some scientists estimate that up to 80% of all infections are transmitted by hands. And the germs can live on our hands for quite some time unless we clean them. If we don't clean them and we go and touch something in the meantime, we can spread those germs to other places or other people, and disease can be spread this way. Animals can carry germs that can make people sick, and these germs can be not only on the animal, but can be in areas where the animals live as well. When people do regular hand washing, especially with children, that you supervise that hand washing, so you make sure the children are doing it properly and for the length of time that's necessary. They're coughing and sneezing onto their hands and touching doorknobs. They're using shared objects like pencils or toys. And disease is passed easily from one child to the next. Try and avoid sneezing into your hand because you just contaminate them and then spread those germs everywhere. Focus on sneezing into your elbow like this and then you don't contaminate your hands. Turn on the water, wet your hands, apply a good amount of soap and lather up, and then focus on washing your hands for about 20 seconds, about the time it takes to sing Happy Birthday twice. Focus on washing the front of your hands, the back, in between the fingers, around the nails, and so on. And then rinse everything off. Use something to wipe your hands after that, preferably something disposable like a paper towel, and then use that to turn off the tap as well. If you get a chance, Use that to also open the door to the bathroom as you're leaving. The best way to wash your hands is using running water and soap, but sometimes we don't have that available. So think about carrying with you a hand sanitizer. That should have at least 60% alcohol content. It's important to realize that those agents don't remove soil and other material that might be on your hands. And in that case, you really need to use soap and water. If you've been touching objects all around you all day long, just assume that your hands are contaminated and make sure before you prepare food, you wash your hands. Before you eat, that you wash your hands. You can't emphasize hand hygiene enough. 
clean hands save lives. Keeping your hands clean is a very important activity both at home, at school, at work, and in the healthcare setting. Hand hygiene or hand washing is the single most important thing that you can do to help prevent the spread of infection and to stay healthy and well. sanitizer in child care. Do we really like to use those in child care? No. no. Because they have, a, they're, they're, they have a very high concentration of alcohol in them. And if a child would even accidentally ingest a small amount, they could potentially become toxically poisoned by that. So we really want to make sure that we're not using alcohol-based sanitizers and that we're using soap and water. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. I want everybody to stand up. And let's wash your hands together. Because I want all of you to be the ambassadors to go back to the programs and make sure that this hand washing procedure, we turn on the cold water first, then the hot water to gauge for temperature. Temperature is good. So we get our hands wet, right? Okay. Soap. Two to three, four squirts of soap into our hands. Palms. Making a bubble glow. Backs of hands. Backs of hands. Between fingers. Between fingers. Tips of fingers. Tips of fingers. Thumb. Thumb. Fingers. Individually. Okay. Wrists. 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 All of the water, all the salt and water going down the drain with our fingers pointed downward. Paper towels, dry. Turn off the faucet with the paper towel and throw the paper towel into a hands free garbage can. We're done. You know what, Monica? I know saying that I don't know if a lot of centers have them, but a lot of public places have an automated time water. And it's often not enough time. You have can't push it a pain or can And so some kids say, well, the water went out, so I'm stopped. All right. So we need to really be mindful. I was actually at a center like that, and I, I felt like the kids were struggling just to get enough water all the time. But it, it with patients, though, if they just push it down once, usually it'll stay down until they don't get it pushed down all the way. Then it, it comes up a little bit short. So you really have to show the children how to use those types of things. Yes. We have bars and you know some places don't have the can't you know the fence are working properly and they might put a bar soap out. Well bar soap is not recommended in a group setting any longer. Just because germs can live on top of soap too, on top of bar soap. So in the group child care setting, we have to use the liquid soap from the dispenser. All right, any other questions about hand washing? I want to play the song at home, and I put the link on your handout just because I thought it was a pretty good song and something that might make hand washing interesting for your children. Yes. Also, do you have this unique senior? Because even with this one, it doesn't show the same detail the way your. Uh, yes. Actually, yes. you know, I read all of the procedure. It, it does actually say that, but when they say between fingers, I mean between fingers. You know, this is the way we really should be teaching children, especially when they come back in outside, they have visible dirt on their hands. This is really the way you address between fingers. This is satisfactory. This is the best. I'm teaching you the best. All right, so here's the song. This podcast is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, Safer, Healthier People.
Files and your account information, visit www.cdc.gov or call Any more questions about that? So let's talk about universal precautions. We're talking about universal precautions. What do we mean in child care? Anybody want to take a guess at what that means? Universal? Uh, Go ahead. Basically, preventing any uh, contamination. By making sure you have gloves available uh, in case they're running over to uh, uh, change the dials or even give a medication. So basically, just making sure you, uh, if you don't have gloves, make sure you have some kind of air to use to get transparent. A couple really good points you made there. And um, universal precautions, also known as standard precautions, are the precautions you take to prevent transmission of germs and disease. Okay, and we do that by a couple in a couple different ways. We do that by wearing gloves, because we assume that all body secretions are potentially infectious, correct? We always assume that for everybody because we don't know. So we protect ourselves by wearing gloves. That's one way. We can also protect ourselves by doing what other thing? Yeah, we just talked about it like hand washing. Hand washing is one of the best defenses, always. <clears throat> okay, so we can do that by hand washing, by wearing gloves, by um, wearing gowns. Sometimes, sometimes you know, uh, teachers that work with infants do tend to want to wear scrubs or gowns just because they are spit up on a lot and that type of thing. And that's a great practice, actually. Do any of you that work with infants have uniforms? Is that your preferred? Just a scrub? Yeah, more scrubs. Mm -hmm. And you have smocks. And you wash them quite, quite frequently, I guess. Yeah. Those are all great. And that's another example of protecting yourself, too. Okay. Um, other ways that you can be, that you can potentially, you know, spread germs is through air, right? Through air droplet through respirations, through children sneezing on you and coughing. How can you prevent, what can you practice in order not to catch a cold or spread a cold yourself? What are some of the things that you can do in childcare? One of them was mentioned in the tape. Coughing in your elbow, right? That's really great. And then the other thing is using a tube like tissue if you have to cough or sneeze. Does everybody have tissues in their classroom? You really should. And do, do you teach children how to use tissues in your classroom? And to always wash their hands after using any tissue. All right. Um, the other thing universal precautions encompasses, so we talked about hand washing, protection with gloves, but it also encompasses surface cleaning. In child care, what do we use to clean surfaces? Bleach and water. Bleach and water. The concentrations now have changed. So I'm going to ask you all to, have you all heard about the bleach concentration change? Some of you have, some of you haven't. Okay, um, I think, Angela, Denise, I think we can send out to everybody the link where it, it's on um, Healthy Child Care America, or you can determine the, the concentration of bleach now. Um, in the stores, for instance, Clorox, it's called super bleach now because the concentration of bleach has been it's stronger. It used to be just 5.25%, it's now 8.25%. So it's stronger, so we have to use less bleach and water. But you have to be really careful because many centers still use generic types of bleach or other kinds of bleach which aren't the super bleach. So you have to really read your labels. And then go to this site where um, I will send you this, the information. You can click on the site and it'll tell you what the concentration for bleach should be based on the type of bleach you're using. Okay, so please make sure to go back and research your bleach. This is really important. Okay, so surface cleaning, we have to be mindful of a couple things. First of all, germs can live on surfaces for how long? 
Germs can live on surfaces up to a month, sometimes even longer. Certain viruses can hang out for a very long time. That's why in childcare, you always have to be washing surfaces, right? With your bleach and water bottle. When I'm talking about cleaning and sanitizing, I'm talking about two different things. Here's soap and here's bleach. We use both in childcare, don't we? Okay. So when we're going to clean a surface, let's just say the, the children um, just finished eating lunch and you've cleaned up all the dishes, and you're going to clean and sanitize the table. We use soap for cleaning because soap is for mechanical cleaning. So we spray down the table with the soap, right? And use a paper towel to mechanically scrub the table, okay? And the other bottle, which is optional, that you can also use is just a plain water bottle to actually rinse that soap off. And I've seen that in some centers, and that's a good practice. It's not required, but it is a good practice. After that, and after you've done that mechanical cleaning with the soap, and I'm calling that cleaning, then we do sanitizing. What do you sanitize with in childcare? Bleach. So then we go back to the same table, and we spray it down with bleach. How long does the bleach have to be on that surface? A minimum of two minutes. Whatever hasn't evaporated after that time, you can blot up with a paper towel. Yes? For food experiences? Yeah, you know, you um, a couple things here. There's Unfortunately, no real good evidence that those Lysol bleach wipes are effective. That's why they're not recommended in child care settings. Now in my home. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I do too. And the thing is, there's no evidence to prove that they actually kill the germs they say they do. There's been all kinds of research done, so that's why in child care we don't use those. I suggest, if possible, if if they can't carry around bottles, that's really the best. I mean, if they're, they're on the road, I'll yeah. so. Yeah. But they're practical. Yeah. And there are bottles, you know, the Clorox bleaches you can buy on the counter, too. The, the Clorox cleanser bleaches that come in the bottle. Those might work in home, too. It is something to think about. In terms of bleach, though, how often does it have to be made? Every day. Why? Because bleach breaks down pretty readily. And bleach should be stored in what kind of bottles? Plastic. Plastic and opaque. It shouldn't be clear because bleach should not be, um, sunlight should not be hitting a bleach bottle directly because it'll break it down. Um, I was saying in sites where they just have the one bottle that contains both soap and bleach. That's the no-no, right? Oh, absolutely, we can't do that. That won't work. Because the idea is to, to clean, mechanically clean the, jerk, the, the big stuff off, you know, to try to get all the dirt and grime off the table by mechanical cleaning, and going back and then disinfecting with bleach to actually get all of the germs off. So you really do need both. Yes? Yeah, you know, I've, I've done, seen both. I, I have read that it doesn't really matter as long as you're not directly over it. So the idea is, did everybody hear Kathy's question? Should you add bleach to water or water to bleach when you're mixing it in the bottle? You can, I think you can do either one from what I've read. It's just that it's important to keep it away from you so you're not inhaling any of the fumes, the bleach fumes. You need to have two bottles at the centers. You must have two. You one must. with soap and one with bleach. Yeah, and that's a DCFS and label regulation. And label it, right? Yes. See my bottles? That's okay. great. Okay. Because I've seen that a lot of sites that just have one, and that's the bleach. You see that a lot. That's, yeah, that's not going to be acceptable in terms of DCFS. Yes. I know the ratio for bleach and water, but is there a ratio for soap and water? No, there isn't. And what do different places use? You can use anything for soap. A lot of places use just plain Dawn dish soap, and that's fine. 
Because all you're doing is mechanical cleaning. Yes. Also, uh, paper towels only, because I've seen some sites that use towels and sponges. Oh, yeah. So, paper towels only to clean the tables. Good tip. And it's required. Yes. Uh, is there a separate bottle for the diapering table? Yes. Diapering tables should have their own bottles. Yeah. Just because you use them so often, you have to use these after each time you change a diaper. The same amount of bleach in the diapering bottle as the yes. table? Mm -hmm. Yes. So okay. for the diapering table, you need soap, the soap bottle too? For, yes, you need soap, soap and, and bleach. And bleach? Mm -hmm. Both. So I'm saying not to mix the bleach and water. Are you saying use straight bleach? You prefer? Oh, no. 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 There's not a concentration. Yeah. Not soap, not soap and bleach. I mean water and bleach. Water and bleach. They used to be, you would take it, uh, a cap of bleach mm -hmm. and water. You put a cap of bleach and put a water. So are you still saying just straight bleach? No. Are you still mix it? You have to mix it. Yeah, Wait, because you're saying bleach the water or water to bleach by the fume, which one do you put first? That's oh, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You, you always uh, okay. concentrate on right. the bleach. No. You have to go straight to the Right, okay. The bleach, the bleach okay. concentration has changed, but how you mix bleach is not changed. Okay. okay. So, yes. And then you should have four bottles, two bottles <laughs> for the soap and bleach for the Tables and other separate room for the diaper. There should be a separate one. Just because I don't know how the teacher could manage doing all these diaper changes, running around looking for bottles all day long. That would be really tough. So Monica, we yes. just want to add, we know that once we finish with these bottles, we put them away out of children's reach. I've seen them lay still sitting on the table. Yeah. Please put those things out of children's reach up on the top shelf in the lock cabinet, do not leave it out so kids can have that. Good point. You know, a lot of the early Head Start centers that I've been to have these bottles up on a shelf right above the two right. tables, right. out of right. reach of the babies. Yeah. So they have, teachers have to really reach for them. So that's the best place to put them. The other thing, I just have to share this because I was at a center the other day. You know, this is a new program year. We have all new children at all these centers. And I'm not sure what exactly happened. I think the teacher got busy or whatever and left that, that cabinet in the bottom under the sink unlocked. They had the bleach bottles. And I walked in the classroom and sure enough, there was this child with a bleach bottle in his hand. And I said, oh my heavens, what's this? And, it, and it's because the teachers aren't used to these children. They're new children. They're exploring their environment. And that's what kids do, right? So this is the beginning of the school year. Please be extra diligent about making sure that things are locked up in those cabinets. Okay? Just a reminder, you know, always have those bottom cabinets locked. <coughs> uh, anything for home visiting that you'd like to add in terms of cleaning and sanitation? Well, I mean, so we just need to be bridging our toys or surfaces? And, and surfaces. I, I just wanted to bring up this one point in terms of home visiting. If you're ever unsure and you don't have bottles and you don't have anything clean to put something on, newspaper is one of the cleanest things you can use. And um, actually, in my past, I was a visiting nurse back when we had visiting nurses and public health nurses in this world, back when I was a very young nurse. And that's what we put down to do everything. This was before we had all these fancy cloths and disposable this and that. We always use newspaper, and that was considered a clean surface. So if you're ever in a pinch, and a, I still do home visits too for different early head start programs, and I still use my newspaper to put my bag down. Yeah, it's a barrier, and it is clean. All right. All right, so let's see. What time is it? Um, we just need to go through. Oh, we've got a little bit of time yet. All right, so universal precautions. I just want to cover a few more things about that. There are four ways that we can transmit germs. Okay, we talked a little bit about the respiratory way of protecting yourself by putting, uh, by coughing and sneezing into your arm, and also directing the children to do that too. Okay, that's real important. The direct contact route, and that's, that's why we're going to talk about wearing gloves. 
We don't really have to deal with any type of bodily fluid in children. We have to wear gloves. We have to wear a new pair of gloves each time. Do you ever reuse gloves? No. No. You want to make sure that you wash your hands before you put your gloves on, right? Okay. Then you put your gloves on like this. And make sure that they're not ripped when you put them on because some gloves can work pretty easily. Okay. Get your gloves on. You do your task. Right? And it's time to take your gloves off. You want to make sure that you pull up the glove this way. Can everybody see this? Yes. Pull up your glove. Ball it up in your other hand like this. Slip your finger underneath the other glove. Do this and put it in the garbage like that. Okay? Then what do I do? Wash my hands. Wash my hands because are my hands dirty? Absolutely. Gloves do not mean that your hands are protected. Okay, you still have to wash your hands. Yes? When you're vaccinated, do you always use two gloves or do you use one? Two, always. Always. Because you never know what's going to happen with those diapers. Know what's going to happen when you're changing that thing. Correct? All right. A couple other things. I just want to go through. The, yes, you're mostly center-based. I brought my universal precautions kit. Do you all have these in your classrooms? Have you seen these types of kits in your classrooms? They're usually in a box, like a first aid kit. This is the DCFS requirement. It's, I don't know if you, do you know what I'm talking about when I talk about a universal precautions spill kit? No? no? Okay, so let me show you what this is for. Okay, sometimes children have nosebleeds or there's blood, obvious blood on the floor from an injury or some other thing, okay? This, this is a universal precautions blood spill kit. Should we ever just, if there's blood on the floor, let's say if a child had a profuse nosebleed, should we ever just take a paper towel and just wipe up blood? No. What can happen? It can splatter all over. It can splatter in your eyes. It can, it can get in your mucous membranes, your nose, your mouth. Okay, so you don't want to expose yourself or the other children to blood. This is specifically for blood. So what we can do is this. We can put on our gloves, okay? And I'm going to pretend that this area right here is a puddle of blood. Can you all see that area? All right, and then there's this, in the kit, there's this, it's a gel. It comes like this in a plastic bag. It's similar to the stuff that janitors use to clean up vomit, but this is specifically for blood. And I open this up and I pour it on the blood. And what's going to happen is this blood is going to gel. It's going to become hard. Okay, and we want it to become hard so it won't splash all over the place when we try to clean it up. Then in the kit, there's a scraper. Sometimes you see these little white or red shovels that come in these universal precaution kits. This particular one is a cardboard scraper. You take your scraper <coughs> and you scrape it up. Usually, there's like something else. Like this. You scrape it up like this and put it all in your red bag. You see that? It's all in the red bag. Then there's a solution. It's, it's called a sanitizing solution, but it's actually for blood. So it can kill both viruses that hang out in blood and bacterial germs. So we want to make sure that we put this on the surface where that blood was and that we use a paper towel at that point and just wash it all down. And then we throw a paper towel and this in here. Then off our gloves just like I showed you. Put them in here. Then there's a towelette in here. It's really important that you use your hand, use this and towelette your hands because this has a particular solution in it that will kill any viruses or bacteria that might be on your hands for cleaning up blood. And then you put that in there and then you tie this up. And in the city of Chicago, after it's tied up and it's in a red bag, it can go into regular garbage. It doesn't have to go into a biohazard special garbage. Okay, yes? 
I never knew about universal precautions kit. I've never seen it. It's not in the list for the to have it in your first aid kit. No, it's not so, usually kept in the first aid kit. So we make sure you have it then. It should be right next to the first aid kit. So usually there's a first aid kit that's mounted on the wall in most places, or it might be high on a shelf. And then next to it should be the universal precautions kit. So because what we do on my own, I've put a biohazard bag in every classroom first aid kit, in every traveling first aid kit, and they all have antiseptic wipes. And if there's a nosebleed or bleeding, whatever it is in the classroom, whatever gauze or whatever they use, they'll put it in the biohazard bag, and then the janitors will come and do a little cleaning. Meanwhile, they'll put like Clorox, like the water Clorox in the water and soap, and make sure the kids are away from it. So. If there's blood that you have to clean up, you really should be using a universal precaution blood still care. That's probably something Yeah, yeah. Read about Everybody gets one. Yeah. They're not expensive either. Am I the only one who doesn't have it? <laughs> <laughs> or is it the first time? Because, yeah. Um, I, we order ours from the soon. And is that, and there's a phone number here. Was that antiseptic wipe the last thing that they have to it's wipe your hands? Or is it the BLCK? It's the benzyl chloride. <laughs> and they're really handy to have and they're the safest thing for people to use to clean up blood. Okay, any other questions about universal precautions before we move on? In the city, okay. did everybody hear this question? This is a good question. <laughs> Basically, I wanted to find out um, were we going to be charged with using that because, and this was maybe a year or two ago, when we were going to dispose of something like that, they said that we could be charged for using that bag. In the city of Chicago, if you use a red bag, you can put it in the regular garbage. If you're a child care center. All right. I want to talk a little bit about toy cleaning. How many of you have toys in your center? A couple people. Okay. Everybody's in the Okay. So let's talk about appropriate toys, first of all. Who are zero to three programs here? Raise your hands. Who's zero to three? Home visiting zero to three. Okay. Great. Zero to three programs. All of your toys need to be washable. Are we in agreement? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Why? What happens with zero to three year old kids? What do they do with toys? Go right to their mouth. So we have to be ready for that, right? Okay. Three to five, not so much, but you still have to be careful because we have some new young threes that um, still kind of mouth things. So you have to really be careful in your three to five classrooms. All right, I want to go through this very carefully. All right, now we talked about cleaning before. When we're talking about cleaning toys, toys have to be both clean with soap and sanitized with bleach. I want to hear how, uh, let's see, how do you clean? Well, we actually, we... Okay, toys require an additional step after washing with soap and water. The next step is called disinfection. Disinfection is a process using chemicals to kill germs. Disinfectants are stronger than soap and water, and the disinfection process requires that the toy or object soak, soak in the chemicals for several minutes in order to allow the chemicals to, time to kill the germs. Okay. Bleach is the chemical used to disinfect toys. All right. Can we use dishwashers and washing machines to clean toys? Yes, we can. Toys that are able to be washed in dishwashers and, and 
washing machines should be washing it. All right. Let's, um, okay. Let's talk about hard plastic toys. Which are most of the toys in zero to three? Number one, we scrub the toys in warm, soapy water, using a brush to reach crevices in toys. Two, rinse the toy in clean water, which would be like the second tub or the second bin that you would use. And third, we would immerse the toy in bleach solution and allow it to soak for 15 minutes. Okay. After 15 minutes, remove the toy from the bleach and rinse it well in clean water, and then you lay it out to dry. Any questions about that? Toys used by children greater than three years old. Toys that are used by children older than three and who do not place toys in their mouths should be cleaned at least weekly and when obviously soiled. A soap and water wash following by, followed by clean water rinsing and air drying is adequate. Disinfection is not required because they don't put these things in their mouth traditionally. But if they do, they do need to be sanitized with bleach. Water tables. Who uses water tables here? A lot of folks, okay. Water tables are, are, you have to be really careful about water tables. We heard from someone who pointed out that you actually should have children wash their hands before and after using a water table. That is very smart. Water tables need to be disinfected with bleach solution before filling it. Disinfect all toys to be used in the water table. There should be no sponge toys. Anybody have sponge toys? Okay, good. Have children wash their hands before and after using the water table, and do not allow children who have open sores or open wounds to use the water table. Okay. Questions about toy cleaning and sanitation. Do you think that you? Think, okay. Well, here. Come on. <laughs> I like to hear it from the source. <clears throat> this is great. I love hearing about how programs can adapt and individualize. I have a child with eczema. Do you all know what eczema or eczema is? Yeah. Okay. So she doesn't um, play in the regular water table, but she plays next to it because we have her own container of water. Because sometimes we put color in the water, or soap, and she's allergic to that. So she has her own container. And that's called individual. Yes. So, <laughs> awesome. I think because you're doing a lot of things here. You're allowing that child to have the same experience as the other children, and you're protecting that child from, you know, getting germs from other children, especially if she potentially may have open, open areas for eczema. Okay. Wonderful. Yes, question. I have a question for her. What about if she wants to play with the sand? Do you allow her to play or she's allowed to She's allergic to the sand. So she can't. So what other things that you play with? Sometimes we give them um, um, cotton balls in a container, feathers, mm -hmm. um, sometimes we give them the, um, little big, big a lot of beads that she can play with. Um, Any other questions? Sometimes you can be like such a bad, or you know, because you can't actually touch the sand, you can put it like in a saran, you know, in a sandwich bag, and just put tape real good on the top. As long as you can feel it, yeah, just give her that texture. Would you say great? Yeah, she can even have like uh, oatmeal or gram or whatever. Just a couple other things about water tables. I just want to caution you about water tables. They should be disassembled at least once a week and sprayed through as much as possible with a hose. Just because uh, things like bugs and roaches, they, they love to hang out in the legs of water tables. You have to be really careful with water tables. That's my point, I guess. Um, so. So, Monica, you're saying all the toys in the center should be cleaned once a week? For three to five. For zero to three, it's an ongoing daily process. I just wanted to make sure everybody heard for three to five. 
like once a week. Right. Okay. okay. Should we go with the field party? Yes. Okay. 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 Let's take a look. <laughs> Okay, welcome back everybody. Alright, any questions you thought of during the break? Alright, I just wanted to go over a couple, a couple more things in regards to universal precautions. I want to talk about when to clean and sanitize in child care centers and possibly in home visits. Um, after each use, so every time we use a counter for food preparation or any type of uh, eating from a surface or brushing teeth, the surface needs to be cleaned and sanitized. So what does that mean? Remember, clean with soap, sanitize with bleach. So I'm going to repeat that again. Every time we use a counter used for food or brushing teeth for food preparation, we have to clean and sanitize it afterwards. All right. Anytime a table is used for eating, a changing table used for diapering, or toys that are put in a child's mouth, or dishes or utensils, all of those situations cause are a, a situation when we have to clean and sanitize after each use. Daily, this we're still I'm talking about when to clean and sanitize. Daily, toilets, sinks, kitchen floors, counters, and tables, garbage cans. Garbage cans is daily. <coughs> Toys and surfaces in the child care setting, and doorknobs. Do you think at all of your centers and programs? Are you doing that, all of those things daily? Okay, yeah. you do. Good for you. These are really important things to be looking at daily. And we're going to talk a little bit more about toileting and talk about toilets later on. But um, they should be clean and sanitized daily. Weekly, under weekly, we have cubbies, cribs, drinking fountains, refrigerators and trash cans. Those are the big trash cans. Those should be cleaned and sanitized weekly. Pardon? Sure. Weekly, cubbies, cribs, drinking fountains, refrigerators, and trash cans should be cleaned and sanitized weekly. Okay, now I'm going to talk about vacuuming, mopping, and sweeping. Daily, should be all rugs and floors should be vacuumed or mopped. Under wash, things that need to be washed daily, any laundry, uncarpeted floors, and mop heads. Spot clean, and that, that would mean, you know, just when you see something dirty, you would clean it up at that moment. Spot cleaning would be walls and carpeting. Deep cleaning should occur every six months for walls and for carpeting. Blood spills, we talked about that. Did we have that one? Uh, this one, this is actually on oh, the website. Yeah. Have you all seen this? No. It's Universal Precautions, and this was put out by DFSS, and it's on the website under Content Area Health. Universal Precautions. This is pretty handy, and it <coughs> tells you when everything should be clean and sanitized. Also on the DFSS website is the gloving procedure. <coughs> I don't think that's in your packet because it's on the website. This is good to have posted, especially around the diaper changing area. Okay. All right. Um, I'm trying to talk about other things. I just want to take a few minutes to talk about toileting and childcare. How many of you are potty training children right now? How many programs? So it looks like there's a smattering of you that are potty training. And also in some three to five programs, you know, there's ongoing potty training for some children. 
so I think this is a great time to discuss this. In terms of cleaning and sanitizing and making sure that we're adhering to the diapering policy and procedure, when children are being toilet trained, does a child ever take off their own soiled diaper? No. No. And, uh, and the reason I'm mentioning this is I've seen this on, in a number of different sites. And when I ask teachers why that is, they tell me it's part of developmental learning. And I said, really? <laughs> because to tell, I, I can't really understand why a child would developmentally have to learn how to change their own diaper. Because they probably won't be doing that until they're about 80 or 90 years old again. So that is not a good explanation. So a child should never ever be changing their own dirty diaper, or taking off their own camper, or changing their own polo. Does that all make sense to everybody? Okay. So when a child, you bring a child into the washroom for, and they're undergoing potty training, just say, you bring your, your little two and a half year old into the washroom, the teacher with her gloves on takes off the soiled diaper, or even if the diaper's not soiled, we, we take off whatever is on the child for that child. And then if, if the child is soiled, either with urine or you know, poop or whatever, the teacher cleans the child. It's just like the diapering procedure. It doesn't change just because the child's now vertical and not horizontal. The diapering policy <coughs> procedure stays the same. Does that make sense for everybody? Whatever this diapering procedure says, we continue to do it as long as the child is wearing a diaper or a pull-up. So that means the teacher cleans the child with the pull-up or the pamper that's undergoing potty training. So you take off the soiled diaper with your gloves, right? You put it into the bag that you have right by your side because we know we're changing a diaper and we always have a plastic bag to put the soiled diaper in. So you have your soiled diaper, you put it in the plastic bag then you want to clean the child with wipes. And you clean, you know, from front to back, front to back, with your wipes. Then you can have the child sit on the toilet. Do we ever have a child go directly to a toilet without being cleaned by a teacher? No, it is gross. I see this all the time, though. The child say, okay, I took off your diaper, go sit on the toilet, we're potty training. No, because the child's still dirty and you're sending that child to go sit on a toilet that's a community group child care toilet. So the child must be clean before they sit on that toilet. If a child accidentally gets away from you and goes and sits on the toilet before they can clean, what do you have to do to that toilet? You have to clean with soap, sanitize with bleach. Okay? That is a going to be a real problem for some programs that aren't used to doing this. And I'm really concerned for when the feds come in and see that kind of practice. That is not good practice and that is not what we practice. Okay. So any questions about toileting and potty training and the diapering process? We're continuing to use the diapering procedure for all children wearing diapers or pull-ups. Is that clear to everybody? Yes. That's right. Uh, I'm, I'm confused about it because um, somebody told me that, well, that, um, that I, we are not allowed because we, we do yeah, I don't know where this kind of stuff comes from. Did y'all understand that question? I've heard this before, by the way. That if a children has let's, a, a, a already toilet trained child has an accident, and this happens everywhere. The question is, does the teacher clean up that child, or did, does the teacher have the child clean themselves? The answer is this, the teacher cleans the child, okay? This is not a situation where a child should be cleaning themselves, for a couple of good reasons. A child with, that's incontinent could 
passively spread all this stuff and germs all over the place. The teacher is wearing gloves. The teacher understands the policy and procedure of how to clean that child. A two and a half year old or a three year old does not have that knowledge. Okay, so if a child has an accident and is already potty trained, the teacher cleans up the child. Okay, that is always what should happen. And the, the child should be brought in a, a private place. This should not be done in the community bathroom. You know, this can be done with other children not around. Because it can be really hard on kids. Um, any questions about toileting? This is a, a really important piece of this training, is to make sure that this concept gets through. So there is going to be a period of time where the child is going to be able to clean the environment. Yeah, I mean, we teach children to wipe themselves. But if they can't do a good job, and it's obvious they're making a mess, the teacher steps in. You know, and this is during potty training. The child has a successful event in the toilet, and the next thing the teacher is going to say is, you need to wipe yourself. And it's going to either watch the child do it properly, or if the child can't do it, the teacher will show the child, or teach the child, and observe the child and help that child. Okay, that's how it should go. The child's learning, but still needs assistance in most cases, especially if the child can't do these things on, by themselves quite yet. We, don't, we want to make sure that kids are, are cleaned up properly so that they're not spreading germs all over the place and that they are comfortable too. Make sense to everybody? I hope this isn't riveting news. But I, I've been a couple places last week and it was riveting news. So let's talk a little bit about diapering and the, and the procedure. Do you all have this handout? No, we don't have this handout. Okay. Let's see if I can pull this up. Then, let's see. Who has a strong voice that would like to read this? <coughs> Anybody want to volunteer? Because we want to read this together because it's a it's an interesting policy, and you really have to understand it. <laughs> cover, ta cover table surface with disposable paper. Remove from containers and place on diaper surface away from the child's reach. Wipe, clean diaper, dab of diapering cream on facial tissue if needed. Plastic bag for soiled clothes if needed. Let me stop you here. How many programs use plastic bags to dispose of a diaper right on the table versus putting it directly into a garbage can? What do you use? Okay, so you use the individual plastic bag? That's acceptable. What else do programs use? Um, I think so we do something different. Oh, no. Okay, so we have everything on the table, we clean the diaper, and then we put the diaper inside our gloves. Like we take off the diaper, we roll it up, take off one glove, take off the other glove, then we throw it in the diaper. And then we wipe our hands with wipes, and we use hands with wipes, mm -hmm. and then we put on the clean diaper. Okay, you wrap it in your glove? Yeah. Is that always successful though? I mean, do you ever have like a mess or anything? I'm not yet. <laughs> yeah, and I think as long as things don't go flying out of the diaper. Yeah, like obviously like the diarrhea or yeah. something, there's a lot of yeah. bags. And then where do you put put everything in, directly into the garbage? Yeah. In, directly into a garbage. Is the garbage There's a receptacle thing? separate from the regular garbage. It is there's separate. There's the one with, where you press with the lid, mm -hmm. right? The foot and pedal? The, yeah, so that's specific yeah. for diapers. Okay. And, and the regular garbage can Okay. And is it lined with a plastic bag? There's anybody using diaper genies? Good. Because the diaper genies aren't really effective anyway. But it sounds like your system is good. Does anyone put anything in a sink? Dirty diapers in sinks? Okay. I've seen that actually recently. Um, okay, so I'm glad to hear everybody knows how to dispose of a dirty diaper. This is one of the things DCFS is all is always looking at when they come in and monitor you, the licensing rep, 
you're looking at how you take off and how you dispose of dirty diapers. Okay, so that's a really good point. It sounds like everybody has a good system here. Okay, so number two. Um, place child on diapering surface. Always keep a hand on the child. Very important. If something that's not mentioned in this, and I just want to mention it because it is part of what we do in Early Head Start, is what do we do with children while we're changing their diaper? Teachers. We talk to them. We talk to them. We tell them what we're doing, right? We explain things. We tell them when things are going to be cold, possibly when the wipes come in and things like that. We can sing to them. I've been in some centers that have mobiles up right above the diapering changing table, which is pretty cool. I was at a, set, a center yesterday that had a mirror above there so the child can watch, look at themselves. I just thought that was kind of nice. And it also, it keeps the child engaged and it explains, and you're telling that child what's happening. So they're a participant in the procedure. Does that make sense? Remove bottom clothing, including shoes and socks, if feet cannot be kept from contacting soiled skin or surfaces. If clothing is soiled, remove and place in a plastic bag. Any questions about that step? We're just going to talk about each of these steps so that we have it down. Okay. All right, number four. Unfasten diaper, but keep soiled diaper in a child's body. Lift the child's legs and clean bottom from front to back. Use a fresh wipe each time. Do you all use a fresh wipe each time when you go front to back? It should be one wipe, front to back, one side, one wipe, front to back, the other side, then the center, front to back. At least a minimum of three wipes. That's what I like to see. That's, a re that's really cleaning the child. Any questions about that? Okay. Put soiled wipes in soiled diaper, then remove diaper and dispose in plastic lined, hands free covered can. Re remove gloves, dispose in hands free can. Use separate fresh wipe on adults and child's hands, dispose in hands free can. Okay, this is a step a lot of folks miss. And this is, the, this is the step that a lot of DCFS licensing reps write people up for, is this wipe. There's, and you know, I want to explain something about this step. This step separates the dirty part of the diaper change from the clean part that's coming up. That's why you're washing your hands with a wipe. That is a really important part of this procedure. Not all states follow this procedure, but in the state of Illinois, it is written into the DCFS licensing code. Okay, that's how important it is. Does this apply to a child standing in a bathroom, being potty trained? Yes. Should you be using a wipe to wipe that child's hands after the teacher has cleaned up that child? Yes. yes. And should the teacher be using a wipe to clean her hands? Yes. yes. The policy and procedure does not change because the child becomes vertical. <coughs> All right? Okay. Next. If paper is soiled, fold the clean side of paper back on your child's bottom. <coughs> Put clean diaper under child's bottom. If using diaper cream, apply with facial tissue. Okay. Does, does everybody do that, use a facial tissue to dip into a tub and put it out and not, not put your glove in or anything like that? Alright. Okay. Fasten diaper and redress child. <coughs> okay. Wash child's hands and sink. Return child to supervised area. Um, clean and disinfect. Dispose of changing table paper. If diapering surfaces are visibly soiled, wash surfaces with detergent, water, and paper towels. Rinse surfaces with water. Now we're not doing this just if. We just do this. Okay, this is not an if in the state of Illinois. This is a must. Mm -hmm. 
so if if it's prescription and you have a sign yeah if, that's a good point yeah if it's a prescription and the parent has signed right and a parent has signed a medical consent form for you to administer a diaper cream then it's okay but you cannot use any other you can't just use desnix or whatever on a baby without parent permission and a prescription for it Wait, very so good for, point. for any creams whatsoever? Right. You have to have parent signature for anything you put on a baby. Okay. So if a parent brings in a desitin, we can't use it. It no, it's supposed to well, you they should have an accompanying doctor's note if you're using a diapering cream. There usually should be a reason for a cream. And you want to know what that is. Just as a teacher, you want to know anything that you're giving a child or putting on a child, what it's for. Okay. This goes to the over the counter, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Over the counter is not bothering the hospital. But most parents that do want those things applied, they will bring you a doctor's note if the doctor is in agreement. It's just safe practice. Any other questions about this? So, go on to number C. Um, when all diapering surface with disinfectant solution. Need solution on for required contact time. What's the required contact time? Two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Um, wash hands. Use use of an alcohol-based hand sanitizer is okay for adults. No, we don't. That's, we don't <laughs> use that. Okay. Disregard that step. If diapering surface is wet after required contact time, dry with clean paper towel before next change. Okay. And then the last thing you do is you always document, right? On your daily care sheet. Everybody uses a daily care sheet? Yes. Okay. All right. Any questions about that? I have one. Yes. Yes. Oh, back to the cream. When you have powder cream, you have to take off the glove and put the cream on board before you have powder cream. So you use the same glove that you wipe the cheek while you wipe the cheek. I put a clean glove on. Okay. <coughs> oh, sometimes the teacher might walk away to get the child some, you know, wipes or something, you know. Shouldn't they buckle them down with a belt? Well, the very first step, that's, this is a good question. The very first step of this procedure is, let me go back to number one. It says, have, give, teacher gathers everything. Okay, so you really shouldn't have to walk away. If you have to because something's missing, maybe ask, call one of your teachers to get it for you. But the very first step is to prepare. See, number one, how she prepares everything. So you don't have to move around to go get things. We should never leave a baby unattended. And the best thing to do is always have your hand on that child. If you have to take your hand off the child to reach something, call someone else to get it for you. Um, for three to five, for the kids that are being toilet trained, is that daily reporting? Should that still be halfway with infants? Yes. Yes. That's a really good question. That just came up in the slide so I sent. It is your record that you're potty training the child and that you're observing toileting and, you, and that's the way that you can monitor that. That's really good practice. Any other questions about diapering? Think through your process and let us know if you have a question. Okay. The surface, but the designated diapering surface. You know, that, that brings up a good point because I have seen in centers where teachers will sometimes try to change baby on the floor or different places. You can't do that. None of that is okay. It has to be at the designated diaper changing table. Not on the sofa. Right, not on the sofa or anywhere else. Yes. Suggestions for In terms of diapering, it's the parent diapers. So we work, yeah, wherever the parents. And it's in the home, it's a whole different, it's not a group child care setting. And for a group, we do have the social link Yeah. Uh, but again, it's the parent. Right, it's the parent. 
And um, I just want to mention this for home visiting. We were, we were talking at break, and I just want to make sure that during home visiting socializations, at the beginning of the socialization, that the home visiting staff and home visitors take time to model hand washing for all the parents present at the uh, home visiting socialization so that they can wash their children's hands and their hands before snack. Okay? Let's just, it's really important to emphasize hand washing in every single program model we have. Can we get a copy of this? Yes. No problem. I know for our ratio is like one to five times. And so what we're changing, um, the same, not only the same ratio, but we have each stage for the three to separate our kids. And so if I'm taking my five kids to the bathroom to change, I'm like the other seven kids and have all five kids. I've seen that, and that is really rough for a teacher to do what she has to do appropriately because you're doing a diapering change. If you're doing a diapering change, that's a one-on-one -on -one skill. That's one-on-one. -on -one. If you have four other kids that are in the, all over the place, mm -hmm. that doesn't work out. If you didn't have like, on the clothes. To save time. I don't recommend that. I've seen that in action, and it just never works. It's usually something goes wrong, because you're doing diapering, the diapering procedure, on actually four kids at one time. That never worked. How would better to be the kids the other kids? Yes, and then take them one at a time, do your diapering procedure, and then do your potty training. Right? And we follow the diapering procedure even though the child's being potty trained. It's still the same procedure. And the ratio is one to four. Mm -hmm. Oh, I Anyway. <laughs> That's in the right. It's in the category. Okay. One to four. Okay. Question here. We got a question. Can you buy Chinese New Road? Wait, hold up, everybody. They have an accident. Wait, hold up. Okay, question. They have an accident. It's not your And it stands here not to rent. I know you're not supposed to rent. What does it mean to be high? I know you have to like. It was a lot, so you put that in the toilet, but you can't risk it. I've had a parent get upset about that. That yeah. that's that's a stuck in their underwear. That's, that's what, a good what's question. What's the reason behind that? that you because, because you could be splattering feces all over the place by rinsing. We're not designed in child care to do that. This is a really good question. She's asking, she's a parent who gets upset because when a child has a, an accident involve, involving bowel movement, the parent gets upset because the teacher cannot rinse out a diaper or underwear or anything else before putting it in the bag. It has to be placed intact in a bag and tied off and handed to the parent. The, you, the teacher has no control over that. That is DCFS licensing. I'd be happy to show, show you where. Okay, any other questions? Pardon me? I was thinking about what you just said. And all day long, that bag and that PC is sitting there. It's tied up, though. Yeah, no. <laughs> but the, the chances of you spreading other things around the center are really great if you start all that rinsing and splattering and everything else. And where do you rinse it? Do you rinse it in the toilet? Do you rinse it in the sink? Nothing like that should be ever rinsed in the sink. <clears throat> so that's why it's really not a good idea to get involved in that. And besides that, it is a regulation for that reason. All right. Any other questions about diapering? Can we use cloth diapers? Yes. Okay. That's okay. It's a parent choice. Anything else? Yes. I don't know how to word it, but um, the child's not there anymore. But he's a special needs child, and um, how much weight can it, those um, changing tables? Um, you have to read on your table, but the ones that come down off the wall, 50 pounds, max. So if that child would be up exceeding the 50 pounds per head, and they can, they can stand up okay on their own? No, he was in a wheelchair. 
Oh, that's a different situation. That, you have to have um, do some coordination with um, whoever your health consultant is about that. I've, I've actually consulted on a few of those cases, and we come up with some different things. But you're right, there is a weight max on those changing tables that are in the bathrooms. Anything else? I want to take a few minutes to talk about toothbrushing because that is another area of great concern. Okay, how many times are teeth brushed in center, center-based care? Twice for full day programs and at least once for a half-day program. <laughs> when do children brush their teeth? After breakfast and very good. And everybody's flossing, right? Or trying? Okay. Okay. All right. Let's go through. Let's go through this handout that is in your folder. It's called Techniques of Brushing. I'd like to start with you, man. And if we could go around the table and everybody take at least take one sentence. Okay, you start with the number. Oh, I'm sorry, you start with you. Number one. Um, wash your hands first. Okay, so before brushing teeth, it's after washing hands. Teachers have to wash their hands. Number two, do not turn your toothbrush with anyone. Okay. Number three. Face like a two-side down for fluoride or toothpaste or toothbrush. Again, use a fluoride toothpaste and toothpaste. I'm going to stop here for a minute, and I want to show you how we should be brushing some teeth here. Everybody have one of these guys? Yes. Okay. How many surfaces to the tooth, how many surfaces does each tooth have? Five. Five surfaces. Okay. Front, back, in between on each side of the tooth, side, side, front, back, top. There's five surfaces. So how do we address all of those teeth and children? Okay, you can start, you always want to have a toothbrush. You can either do, do it like this or like this, depending on if you're helping the child or the child's doing it themselves. But it should, the toothbrush it should be at a 45 degree angle, kind of addressing the gum and the tooth in the middle there. Can you see that? And going all around. All around, and then this surface in the back, so the back surface of the tooth, going all around, up here, here, all, all while using a 45 degree angle. Okay. Then you want to make sure that you get the top of the tooth, all the way over here. In the top of the tooth, and then we want to make sure we get what? The tongue. The tongue. The tongue. Okay. All right. For every child, <laughs> can children do this independently? Guess how old children are when they master this skill completely? Twelve. It's a mastered skill at twelve years of age. So do we ever leave a child at the sink with a toothbrush by themselves? No. no. Because what are the children going to do in the sink with a toothbrush? Play. They're going to play because that's what children do. Okay. So the message is when we're hand washing with children and when children are toothbrushing, there should always be a teacher next to them because these children are not at the age where this is a mastered skill, either hand washing or toothbrushing. These skills are in process. They're learning. And it won't be a mastered skill. Hand washing, what did we say? Seven years old. It's a mastered skill. Mastered skill, tooth brushing, is much older, 12 years of age. So a teacher must always be there. When I go into the classroom to observe for tooth brushing and hand washing, if I don't see the teacher, I call the teacher over. What's going on here? This, this is not a mastered skill. This child should not be by themselves. <coughs> Oh, yeah, that's right. You don't do that here because you can use the, the dab on the cup. It's fine. And that's what you do. Okay. 
Okay, okay. what about children? Eight, eight, no, eight weeks to the two-year-olds. If they don't have teeth, we have little um, awesome. spiffies. You can use plain. those, or you can use plain gauze, the disposable gauze. It's, you don't have to have sterile gauze to do that. It can't be non-sterile gauze that comes in that large package. Uh -huh. And when do we when do we address infants' teeth? After what? Well, when do we take care of their teeth? Twelve months. Six months. Yes. Well, the teachers always take care of this, but after yeah. each bottle, we we or a bottle of formula or breast milk, the That's teacher smart. has to use the gauze and wipe out the child's mouth. Okay. And you just wipe it out by wrapping it around your finger, gloves. use your glove finger, mm -hmm. and go through, up and through, around the child's mouth. And they don't necessarily have teeth most of the time, but still, we're getting all that stuff out of their gums. And we're teaching them, getting them used to having something in their mouth. Okay. Because we know if children learn these skills in routines at a very young age, the chances of them continuing through adulthood are very, very good. So we do want to start exposing them. Do you need to, you try to get every tooth, yes, but if, if they're wiggling and fussing and that, maybe the next day you'll get more teeth. But we do have to do attempts. We have to attempt with all children to floss. It's a really good idea. We recommend the pigs. Yes, the picks are great. But they, I bought picks without realizing, and then there's the regular picks with the almost the like stabbing thing. Yeah. So you, you, you have, have to, have to look for the kids friendly, where yeah, it's right, and those are one time use. Yeah. Right. They just, I think it's in the And then to be practical at home, a lot of families just use the roll and they whip it off and then wrap it around the finger and just put it through their. You know, through their, between their teeth. When I said that to our directors, the concern is that if we do that for every kid and we give their own strength, there may be a choking hazard for the children. Really? With a teacher though standing right there and just taking a piece of string off and and having the teacher model it on the for the child. But after they do it on their own, it it hurts to monitor everyone. But with the screen. it's part of the toothbrushing process, though. So if you're brushing teeth at the sink and then you're having the child floss right afterwards, it's really part of it. It shouldn't be a problem. I've seen it work kind of nicely in one center, but it did. There were some kinks to work out, and you do have to you have to consistently do it and exam and show the children how to floss their teeth. Floss their teeth. It does work. It takes time and a lot of patience on behalf of the teachers, but it's worth it in the end. Yes. Would there be a specific training on flossing? On flossing? Yes. Do, does any, do any of the centers, do any of the teachers model toothbrushing and flossing for the children by doing it yourselves? You know, I was at a center yesterday and a teacher whipped out her toothbrush and really did a nice job and she flossed. 
And that's how she starts out toothbrushing each and every day. I thought it was really cool. The kids were all used to it. They knew and they used to, they were telling her what to do at this center because we're so used to her doing her teeth. You know, so I think there is a real value in teacher modeling here, especially for things like toothbrush and flossing. Okay, any questions about toothbrush? Well, does anybody, who's an infant and toddler teacher? Jasmine couldn't make it, but I was wondering if we did have an infant and toddler teacher that would want to do a diapering demonstration. Before you go on, I don't want to forget. <laughs> I just want to say, the ratio for early head start is one to four. If you have more than four children, you are out of compliance, not your group. One to four. I have to go and check it because maybe I'm out of touch or something. What's the challenge? Yeah, worse than three is one to four. directly in your bag. I put it on the wrong side. <laughs> Sorry Thank you. about that. So we're doing. See, I, I see what you're doing. Then I'm cleaning my hands. Important step here, folks. Cleaning my baby's hands. And she's explaining <laughs> to the baby what's going on. I know. It's 
I'll die for baby. For oh, baby. <laughs> okay. Then we're gonna go wash the baby's hands. <laughs> So the baby's in a safe place. Now teacher's coming back to clean up.